I wouldn't say we're exactly bearish just yet. I think as long as the markets on the S&P stays above 436, there's still a possibility that this is just a little small decline, profit taking, and then we go right back up again to test the all-time highs. There will be a recession. It's just going to come later, according to a report recently published by Consensus Economics, a leading survey organization that polls more than 700 economists each month to obtain an aggregate forecast. According to the Financial Times, the consultancy said persistently high interest rates in major economies would lead to growth slowing in 2024 to 2.1% after a better than expected 2.4% in 2023, thanks to strong consumer demand and labor markets. Economist caution is based on the belief that persistently high demand will keep inflation higher for longer, forcing major central banks to keep borrowing costs high well into next year. Now, I've chosen to use the Financial Times as my news source for current events and global economic news because I've personally been following their work for more than 10 years, and they've proven to be a trustworthy, in-depth source of information. What I like is that a lot of their articles are interactive, like the one I just read, and their charts and data can be manually changed to provide a more comprehensive user experience. Currently, over 300,000 global finance professionals use the FT's analytics tools, and you can join them by clicking on the link below that gives you a one-month trial for one dollar. This gives you access to award-winning journalism from a network of over 700 journalists worldwide. And now we'll bring in our next guest to discuss exactly how to invest in this tumultuous and volatile global economic environment. We're speaking now with Emil Singh, founder of Live Traders, and we're talking about his trades and what's next for the markets. Emil, welcome back. Thanks for having me again. Looking forward to chatting again. Yeah, looking forward. Good to see you. Well, last time we spoke was in June. You were telling us about how you were taking some profits off the table. The markets have been slightly up since June, but because of the roller coaster ride we saw in July and then later in August, it's been kind of flat. So that was a very good call. More or less, the markets topped earlier in the summer. What are you doing now? I think right now I'm in the same boat. I think it's a trader's market. I think as investors, there's a lot of uncertainty as we approach 2024 elections and potential talks about, you know, maybe bringing back some of the restrictions from 2020. So I think at this point, it's going to be more of a trader's market. There's a lot of opportunity, a lot of reversal plays, a lot of plays that are going to be bouncing off their lows. So I think uh, that's what I'm looking at at the moment, just trading it and not staying my welcome in a lot of those stocks. Backing up a bit and talking about the macro first, a lot of economists polled by uh, surveys are thinking about pushing back the recession call to next year. One of the views is that because the economy has showed strength this year, because the CPI and the PCE are still hot, the Fed may rate, uh, or keep rates rather high for longer, which means that we're not going to get a recession this year, but perhaps next year the growth will be slower. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Do you agree or disagree? I mean, I think the growth is already quite slowed down for a lot of different companies. You know, you're seeing people have, you know, lowering their prices, even Tesla is lowering their prices as well. So I think there, there's also the recession's already here. The people who are feeling it can really sense it, uh, but the data might not necessarily show. But I think we've all come to the conclusion that the data for the last couple of years has been out of whack. It's not in alignment with what's you know, actual feelings of people, right? The inflation numbers are still high. Uh, product prices are still high across the board. So I think the numbers are not in alignment with what people are actually feeling on the ground. We are going to be talking about Tesla. We'll bring up four stocks today, NVIDIA, Zoom, Tesla, and NVAX. So uh, you've got uh, technicals uh, updates for all of us, uh, for all those stocks for us. Now, Amo, let's talk about uh, what happened earlier in the summer. So we had a bit of a, a pullback uh, after the July high, and then things started to rally again. Were there, were there, some, were there some, um, some, some reasons as to why that you can attribute to this? I think the a lot of stocks have been beaten down. I think 2020, we overshot ourselves to the downside. Classic market, right? The always market overshoots to the upside, which we saw in 2020. Then on the pullback, we kind of overshot ourselves to the downside. So we're definitely seeing recovery in a lot of those stocks, right? I mean, Tesla still hasn't recovered uh, from its 2020 high. So I think those type of bounces in a lot of different sectors, then powered by the AI, like we've seen that with NVIDIA, right? The stocks went to $500. So I think a lot of those movements are causing the markets to stay high. But then the other question is, where else are people going to put their money, right? Banks are not, can't really be trusted anymore as well. But where else would people put the money? There's no, there's still no better place than the U.S. economy or the U.S. stock market. So I think naturally uh, the money is still flowing into the markets. Uh, but I think it's going to be interesting year next year to see what happens closer to the election. 
Okay, so Emil, uh, again, let's do a uh, post-mortem on what happened this summer, just following up on what you just said. So if you were to take a look at the highs in uh, in mid-July, late July, rather, uh, can we just take a look at that chart you have up there? Did the S&P 500 show any signs of being overbought at that particular point? Just to look at the technicals and understand uh, what it looked like back then. Yeah, so technically, one of the things to keep in mind is, again, if you're an investor, you're not really going to be looking at a daily time frame. That's more for traders who are in and out. As an investor, you're going to step back and take a look at, let's say, the higher time frames. But the signs obviously are anytime we approach a prior high, right, where we had a 35% drop from that level, there's always going to be hesitation as we approach that level technically. Because think about it, people who invested over here, they got caught on the downside, 35%. A lot of people who got caught on the wrong side get chances to break even, right? So a lot of times we get hesitation in those levels. And that's what we're seeing here, a little pause, right? So the levels that were overbought, the signs that we would look for technically is, hey, if we had four or five months of upside in a row, right? And we get extended away from our traditional moving averages, which have traditionally held, then that's where we get a little extension and we get a little pullback. And that's what we're seeing at the moment is the markets are deciding, is this going to be a double top? Are we going to start to pull back from these levels? Or is this going to be a smaller, higher low that eventually goes right back up? So I think that hesitation, that uncertainty that the market's facing is what we're seeing, the recent you know ups and downs that we're seeing. Now, if you go on a smaller time frame, you can see that, right? We broke through our little uptrend line over here, right? And then after breaking our uptrend lines, we retested it. And then we kind of stopped at the backside of the trend line. I wouldn't say we're exactly bearish just yet. I think as long as the markets on the S&P stays above 436, there's still a possibility that this is just a little small decline, profit taking. And then we go right back up again to test the all-time highs. The all-time highs being about 4,800, right? You were talking about the yeah, so on high the SPY, from late on last the SPY, year. Yeah. That would be about you know 459 on the SPY. Did the charts ever give you probabilities, uh, just as a generality? Like, did you ever look at a chart and say there's a probability or there's a higher chance of it going to 459 than it is to going to, let's say, 429, for example? So ba based on my analysis, I don't think we're going to start to you know pull back right at these levels. I think we have another high left, which might even exceed the previous high of 459 on the SPY. So my analysis, as I've marked out these levels, Suggest that I think we're going to get one more rally probably into 461, 463 before any lengthy pullback. So I think this is just an intermediate profit taking uh, that will eventually result to the upside, in my opinion. I want to just bring something to your attention. If you take a look at the um, mid cap stocks, so Russell 2000 index, that's been underperforming the S&P uh, this year. And actually underperformed the NASDAQ as well. So the large caps have been beating the uh, the Russell 2000 index. When you look at that, do you think to yourself, either the large caps are, are overbought or the uh, mid caps are just undervalued or perhaps it's fairly valued and they're just not performing well for a reason? Do you see that divergence to think to yourself there's an opportunity somewhere? Yeah, I think uh, the, it shows that the market is risk averse. You know, they want to put money in the traditional blue chip, well-known names, the safer stocks, so to speak, such as Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, because those have seen great recoveries even past their 2020 highs. So that's where the money is still flowing. I think people are going towards safety as opposed to taking you know smaller bets, speculative bets on smaller cap stocks or even mid cap stocks for that nature. So I think that's why we see you know stocks like Google, Amazon, Microsoft exceed even their 2020 highs, right? So I think uh, to me, that shows the markets are risk averse. Participants aren't really sure. So they don't want to take any bets at the moment. And I think that's going to remain that way until rates are high, right? Until we start seeing a pause or reduction in interest rates, I don't think there's going to be any semblance of money flowing into the smaller cap sector. Uh, well, if you were to identify catalysts for a major reversal, major correction, what would they be? So just suppose we were to get a correction, what kind of catalyst would you be looking for? Well, there's two main catalysts that I see going forward. Obviously, one of them is still the Russia thing. It hasn't been resolved. It's been dragging on for a while. And there have been you know, reports that I've seen that Russia might want to retaliate in some sort of fashion, right? And then the formation of BRICS, which is a huge ge geopolitical error for the United States because they're pushing China, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, all of them closer as BRICS you know, looks to expand with other nations as well. So I think that's going to be a big problem for the United States. Uh, we'll have to see what that results in. Uh, does it result in foreign investors selling U.S. equities? So that's another catalyst. Um, but I think the bigger one is going to be the election, 
because uh you know despite which i you're on uh i think the result of the election of 2024 is, is not going to be a pretty one so i think those are the catalysts that i'm seeing at the moment I don't think market's going to do anything substantial for the next year or till the end of the year. I think majority of the moves are going to be happening next year. As a trader, how important is um, historical pattern repeating? For example, you mentioned the elections. Now, historically, uh, pre-election years have been good for the markets, just like this year. Historic, uh, this year has been pretty good for the markets so far. Would you trade this pattern every single four-year cycle? Uh, so I trust my technicals more than that kind of a pattern. So technically, I mean, we talked about it last time we chatted that the 50 period moving average is traditionally on a monthly chart, a Bible pullback. And anytime markets pull back 30, 35%, it's a pretty good odds that you're going to see a recovery. And we saw that here in 2020, where we positioned ourselves with a lot of different equity positions, market positions. But now, now we got to weigh the risk reward. As a trader, we're always looking at what's the likely probability. Now from here, if the markets go higher, Maybe I got a little bit of a reward left, but the uh, the risk is that we might pull all the way back down. So that's what, as traders, we make the call of, okay, maybe it's time to lighten up. Maybe it's time to take some profits, right? Maybe it's time to get into some recovery plays rather than holding on uh, for our market you know, comeback. So I think we've seen that comeback. Um, it was de definitely a good pattern to buy. Market's down 35%. Never been a bad situation in history to buy that. Uh, and that's kind of what we looked at. Okay. Uh, we're going to get into specific stocks in a minute, but uh, are there any specific sectors that you think are undervalued right now? I think a lot of tech is still undervalued, believe it or not, right? I think uh, we saw good recoveries in NVIDIA, Microsoft, and those sectors. But, you know, those those COVID names, as I like to call them, the, you know, the 2020 names, the work from home plays, uh, they still haven't recovered fully. And we're starting to see some recoveries. If you look at charts like Roku, you look at even Kathy Wood's ARK ETF, they've bounced pretty nicely off those lows. They've seen pretty healthy bounces. So we're focusing on those, but not as investments. We're focusing purely as trades. We're trading those bounces. And those are some rapid bounces. I mean, we talked about last time you and I chatted, we talked about Roku when it was sitting around $54 or $50. And I said, probably going to see a double on this thing, right? The stock went from 40 to 50 to almost $100, right? That's a healthy bounce. You might might not look at it on the chart, but that's 100% bounce on things like Roku. Uh, so I think those are what we're looking at. Some new plays like, you know, we're looking at NVAX, we're looking at Zoom communications, uh, those COVID plays, uh, work from home plays. As we have more and more talks of potentially bringing back those restrictions with the new variants, I think uh, we're going to start to see some movements on those th plays. All right. So let's talk about uh, those stocks. Let's talk about Zoom um, since you brought that up. So uh, Zoom Technicals. Again, one of those stocks that uh, did really well during uh, during the pandemic and then just crashed. Um, from, just from a technical basis right now, is that is this is a huge buying opportunity or what? I think so, but I don't think as an investment opportunity. It's definitely a buying opportunity for me, and we did establish a position full disclosure just a couple of days ago. Uh, so Zoom pulled all the way back down into its pretty much its IPO lows, right, which has been holding as a substantial area of support. And then technically, uh, previous few times we chatted about is the potential stages of the markets, that everything has four stages, right? Sideways, big move up, sideways, and then a big move down. Right now, we're back into a potential technical stage one, which will result in a bounce. So now, if you take a look at the daily chart, going to the smaller time frames, we see that there's a little downtrend line here on Zoom that it just broke out of yesterday on high volume, showing some commitment that, okay, this is a legit bounce to be trusted. And I think Zoom is one that has a gap fill technically around almost about $100. So that would be my target for Zoom. I think Zoom is headed towards $100. Zoom is headed towards $100. Uh, what is that in terms of percentage gain or loss? So right now it's, it's about 70. So, you know, 70 to a hundred dollars, whatever that comes out to be, uh, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, but pretty healthy bounces at these levels. You know, the stock had an all time high of 500. As I've said, I think a previous time we chatted, I don't think it's never going back up again into those all time highs, but can we see rapid bounces just like Roku, right? We talked about Roku last time we chatted stock went from $40 to 98. Same thing is going to happen with a lot of those different plays. Kathy Wood ARK ETF was another one, right? We chatted about around $33. That went to 52. So again, that's about 70% or something uh, around those areas of a bounces. Right. Okay. The uh, uh, the fact that you think it's going to bounce to $100 or could bounce to $100, is that a target for you? So like, let's say once it reaches 100 you would take profits? Yes. For, for me, I would. Uh, as I said, I'm a trader and this is a trader's market. 
Uh, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty ahead in the next year. So personally for me, I am taking my profits along the way. I'm not overstaying my welcome on a lot of those different things. I'm going to stick to my guns, which is it's going to be an uncertain year. And sure, you might miss out on a lot of those stocks, but you'll make up for it in those smaller trades that we take, such as the Roku, such as the ARC, such as the Tesla too. Right? We talked about that last time as well, technical play uh, based on this trend line here. Right? We talked about it when it was breaking this trend line. The stock went almost to what, $300 from those levels. And I think it's still a good one now that it's in an uptrend. I think Tesla is one that we, we have a currently a target of about roughly about 315 at the moment. Uh, from 250 current prices. So that's what we're looking at on Tesla. The uh, This is an interesting stock. So they just slashed prices on their Model S and X. Um, all sorts of reasons as to why people are speculating. One, one reason that I that I think makes sense is that they just released, they just announced their new uh, Model 3 refresh. Uh, so they want to, they want to just, you know, they want to they, they want to pump out inventory, and so they're slashing price on their high end higher end models, so they don't, so people don't I, I guess cannibalizing their own items. Uh, it's not necessarily that they're doing poorly as a company. It's probably just a strategy. Uh, or the other side of the story is that their competitors are catching up, but they need to do price cutting on their higher end models. What do you think is going on? I think it's a it's a great move by Tesla lowering prices because now with the new Model 3, after the tra tax credits, comes out to about 29000 Now, people have a choice. Do I buy a Toyota Camry for $34,000 or do I buy a Tesla for $29,000? That's a clear choice in my opinion. So I think Tesla is going after you know a lot of the, basically the final nail in the coffin for the legacy automakers. And again, choices Camry or a Tesla Model 3, I think it's a very easy choice. But then more so than that, think about it. why would anybody want to buy a Rivian or a Lucid anymore when they can buy a Tesla with these new price cuts, right? So Tesla is really going after their competition with this. I think it's going to further cement their lead because Tesla has the pricing power right now. They're able to cut costs. They're able to bring their own costs down, whereas other EV manufacturers like Rivian and Lucid, they don't have the ability to cut prices that fast. If, in fact, I think just the other day, Lucid uh, CEO came and said, in the next five years, we were aimed to get an EV down to thirty dollars or $40,000, something along those lines. Tesla's already doing that right now. So that shows how much, you know, how ahead they are of the curve. And I think it's a it's a great move. And, uh, you know, recently, if you looked at Tesla's website, auto steer on city streets for the FSD was always coming soon. Right now it's here. They it's no longer coming soon on their website. So auto steer on city streets is here. Uh, they've also cut the prices of the FSD down. I think it's going to increase adoption and they're going to make up for that lost margin uh, with the increased volume. And uh, you can see that on the Tesla website. If you try to place an order just when they cut the prices, you could still get delivery in a week or two. If you go now, the delivery has been pushed back a month or two. That shows that they're definitely getting a lot of orders. Yeah, actually, they've been cutting prices all throughout the year um, in, in steady increments and the price has been... Um you know, it's been, it's had its ups and downs, but on the year it's, it's up a lot. So it didn't really have a negative impact on the valuation of the company. Um, however, people are looking at this as an optics thing. They're saying, well, Tesla can't p compete with the higher end companies. You mentioned Rivian, Lucid, they can't compete with quality and performance. They only have to compete with price. Is that, is that long-term a bad thing in terms of optics? You think? I think what they're going for is FSD adoption. Right, So if they can lower the barrier of entry or people just getting into a Tesla ecosystem in the first place, and then you offer them, let's say, a subscription on FSD, right, $200 a month, something like that. That's how where they're going to see majority of the growth as a software company, you know, increasing the usage and adoption of FSD. And then, you know, you'll see a lot of Ubers being Model 3s, you know, in the future as well, as people start to take advantage of, you know, the savings that they get. So I think there's going to be a lot of volume, they're going to be as anonymous as like, you know, synonymous like an iPhone, right? As you see iPhones everywhere, that's what's going to happen down the line. You're just going to see a Tesla every single where. So I think they're going to make up for it in the volume. I think it's a great move, but again, time will tell. But in our in our opinion, it's the fact that people are no longer have a choice between buying a Ford or a Camry or a Tesla. I think it's an easy choice. And then uh, same for the other EV manufacturers, they're not going to be able to lower their prices this fast. So they're not going to be able to compete. So they're going to be left in the top of the range. And then Tesla will come out with their Cybertruck. They're going to maybe come out with a Roadster at some point, which will compete at the higher price points.
Yeah, I think the only people that are going to be really angry with this are the customers who bought early in the year at a higher price. Uh, do they? Do they? I'm just kind of curious. Do they get some sort of like refund or rebate or something? Like, I would be pretty yeah, angry that, if I bought a Model S two three months ago and then this just happened. <laughs> yeah, that that is the hard one. I mean, if somebody just bought a Model X for let's say one hundred and forty thousand dollars and now I could buy it for eighty six thousand dollars, yeah, definitely wouldn't be happy as a customer. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you still have the product. You still have the great product. Tesla still going to constantly update their car. The, the car, the body is going to be the same, but the software is constantly still be updated. So, you know, technically a Tesla will last you much longer than a traditional car. So, but yeah, the resale value, that's that's the debatable point. But, uh, but let me ask you, as, as a consumer, as a consumer, you're looking at this news and you're saying, well, Tesla cut prices throughout the year. I want a Tesla next year. Well, I'm just going to wait because maybe by the end of the year, they'll cut prices again. So you're just going to keep holding off and keep holding off. And then while you're holding off, some of the competitor lures you and you're, you're buying a you know BMW i4 or something, right? Do you think that could happen? Well, there's always a possibility for that, uh, you know, but at the same time, customers might say, well, maybe they increase the prices now. They've lowered it for so many quarters in a row that maybe they tend to pause their stop or they tend to raise the prices again. So in that case, maybe I'll take advantage of that deal right now. Uh, but again, that's that's a consumer mindset. It's kind of hard to determine. Definitely not a, would be happy as a consumer if I bought it for 140000 and see the same car people can buy for $86,000. Uh, even the ultra red color, I think, was an additional three thousand dollars that they used to charge. Now it's free. So I mean, if somebody paid for that, you know, I, I could feel how they might be feeling. But as a company, I think it's a tr strategically a good move to lower the prices. But as a consumer, probably not the happiest. So yeah, uh, overall, it's uh, it's uh, it's a buy for now. Yes, I currently hold Tesla, still my biggest position. Uh, but I was fortunate enough, obviously, to take advantage of these declines over here. I've taken profits along the way. But then I use this recent pullback that we got in August to establish my position back again. So I'm in Tesla and I don't intend on, you know, my target's 315. Uh, but then even at 315, I'm not going to get out all of it. I'm probably going to still hold half my position, uh, you know, maybe for 400. But I think for now, that's those are the targets, 315 and 400, half and half. But yeah, Tesla, I'm holding pretty much all of my position at the moment. Uh, Tesla is a little bit different from Zoom from a technical perspective because it, the, the the chart looks very very similar to the Nasdaq, um, very close correlation. You, you you could almost say that these larger tech companies have been following the market very closely. So, um, you know, we were talking about company fundamentals, and we we're talking about um, uh, intrinsic uh, company value and and news, but perhaps we should just be looking at the market overall as a guide to something like Tesla. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? Yeah, I would agree. I think a lot of stocks, you know, including. Microsoft, Netflix, Apple, they've all been kind of moving in lockstep. Now, the charts don't look exactly the same, but they do tend to move up together. If the market's up, you're going to see an update on those stocks. So they're definitely loosely correlated. I think at this point, uh, it is the, you know, the market's in a position where people are looking for, okay, what can I hold on for the next five, 10 years and still be okay with it? And that's why you're seeing money still going into things like Google and Microsoft and NVIDIA, even at these highs on NVIDIA, right? You're still seeing money flow into those things because I, I don't think people are willing to take risks yet on smaller cap stocks. So those are going to probably remain beaten down. Let's talk about NVIDIA. NVIDIA is something that didn't follow the market uh perfectly this year. Um, it's just constantly breaking new highs. It, uh, the last earnings report broke the previous um, earnings report in terms of estimates. Now, uh, it, it did scale back a little bit in terms of its stock price. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the tech sector uh, is somewhat still undervalued. Is NVIDIA something that you would say is n overvalued at this point? In my opinion, yes. I would not buy this at this point. But I will also want to preface that by saying I was wrong. I sold my NVIDIA position at 380, right? And it went to 500 because I thought it's overbought at 380. So, you know, I have been wrong on it. I thought it's overbought at 400, but it's, you know, still overbought at 500. But technically, a couple of things we look at is uh, one of the concepts we look at is called a measured move. So based on the measured move, if you measured this low to this high, right? And now we take that similar type of move, right? And we kind of put it over there. Those are the levels as a technical trader, we might decide that, okay, after that, it's a no man's land, right? Anything's possible. Now it's just the market emotions playing rather than the technicals. So I would not be a buyer of NVIDIA here. Uh, if I was the owner of NVIDIA, I'd probably still be taking profits. But again, I've already taken profits at 400, around 380. So I would not be buyer of NVIDIA here. I think NVIDIA is due for a pullback. I do think it's going to have a pullback around 400 anytime soon. 
Do you ever play uh, earnings uh, releases, by the way? Do you ever like place a trade right before an earnings uh, release? Uh, I didn't not to do that as a trader just because, uh, you know, especially if you buy of options before the earnings, uh, then there's a typical concept known as IV crush. So implied volatility gets crushed. So even if you're you're right on your call on the option, you could still lose money. I technically don't do earnings trades unless it's a long-term position, like a Tesla, you know, like a, something else. Then I might hold them through the earnings if it's a long-term investment, but I, I don't take trades before earnings. Uh, I've never had success with that. And I think it's just, it's like a, you know, placing black or red on a roulette table. It could gap up, it could gap down. We don't really know. So I try not to take those 50-50 bets. The last stock you wanted to bring up is NVAX. So let's talk about that. Let me pull up a chart. So NVAX, NVAX. again, another one of those COVID stocks. Look at this. Stock went from $3 to almost $300, something like that, $320. And now it's back down into like the single digits, right? Eight or $9. So now we're seeing the same pattern as we talked about on Kathy Wood Arc, on Roku, on Zoom, on Netflix, all the ones we've talked about previous times we chatted. And same thing, NVAX is down into pretty much its lows where every single time it's come down to these levels, it has rapid bounces. Just look at the chart. It's like a heartbeat, right? Every single time at these levels, it tends to bounce. Now what we're seeing is a volume increase. As it goes sideways, it's seeing that it's not no longer going down and it's seeing increased volume spikes, which shows accumulation. And then NVAX, one of the interesting things that it has a 50% short float, 50%, that's, that's huge, right? So if NVAX starts any sorts of move, which last couple of days it has you know, bounced from $7 to almost $10 today, we are seeing accumulation. In, and I think if the stock gets above, let's say $11, this is one that might see a quick, sharp move back into $50 or $60 per share. So that's what we're looking at. But again, purely as a trade, it's not a fundamental investment or a company that I believe in. It's purely an oversold technical play that I'll be looking for, um, you know, a bounce on to take profits on. It's been uh, trading um, below like $15, 10, $11 for um, quite a number of months already. When you see something like that trading at uh, near its lows for quite a long time, what's your first instinct as a trader? Anything? Yeah, so first instinct is I look at the overall time frame, see where it came down from, and then how it reacted previously when it came down to those levels. So I can clearly see NVAX is a supported stock around these levels. Each time it comes down there, you see short squeezes, and when you combine the fact that 50% short float and the stock is no longer going down anymore, that shows fresh accumulation. And then what we look at is moving averages. I think we also talked about it on the last episode. Now the moving averages that were sloping down have started to flatten out, right? Prices are now getting back above the moving averages. So I think this is a stage one classic sideways consolidation. Once the institutions are you know, finished accumulating their shares or they start to covering their shorts, I think that's when you see these uh, typical trades bounce. And Roku is a great example of that, actually. Look at the Roku here, right? Same thing here. Going sideways for a lengthy period of time, finally gets above the 200 MAs, and then stock rips up, you know, 50, 100%. So I think we're going to see a similar situation uh, on NVAX as a technical trade. Okay, finally, uh, Amal, thank you for that. Uh, let's talk about your book, Prepping for Success, 10 Keys for Making it in Life. I want to bring this up because you've got some interesting themes that traders and investors can apply to their own lives. Uh, before we just talk about the book itself and the themes, generally, what makes a good trader? I know that's a very broad question and you can go <laughs> whichever direction you want, but uh, a lot of things probably go into a good trader. What do you think goes into a good trader? You know, I talked about this uh, recently, like trading was the biggest personal development journey that I've ever embarked on, right? Because as a trader, you're going to see all your limitations, right? Whatever you're struggling with, all of your emotions, all the things that you may be suppressed are all come out, you know, in the markets when a stock goes against you. So I think emotional control, self-discipline, right, uh, is the biggest key to trading. It's not technicals per se, right? I, I can teach somebody the technical part to trade in like two days, right? But can you actually follow it? And more importantly, can you actually stick through it when things get tough? Because not every trade is going to be a winner, right? I lose probably 30, 40, 50% of my trades at some time. But when I win, my winners are typically much larger than the loser. So learning how to have that casino mindset, right? If you go to a casino and uh, you're winning ton amount of money, a casino typically is not going to be you know, mad about it. They just want you to keep playing because they know the longer you play, the odds are in your favor. So once as a trader, we backtest our trading system over the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years, we know we have a certain edge. 
then all I got to do is just keep trading and the edge will you know, play out in a long enough time frame. So having that statistical mindset and that unemotional mindset, things that might not necessarily help you in your relationship life, but definitely help you in trading is being detached to the outcome. I don't care if the stock is called Tesla or if it's called NVAX. We're not going to get married to a position. We're going to be objective, take a step back and look at things the right way. So I think that is the biggest, uh, you know, there's a, more than one thing you ask for, but those are some of the things that makes a really good trader. I actually think that would help in a relationship as well, but that's a different story. Um, but uh, let's talk about what makes a bad trader. I think a bad trader is completely opposite. Emotional, has no trading plan, has never back tested the system. He's trading on feel. I think this is going to go higher. Or I heard somebody says this stock is going to do this, so I'm going to follow. You're following somebody else's plan, right? And we learned that with the Reddit thing that happened. Everybody was telling each other to buy GameStop, AMC. Now look at it. Stock is all the way down. And guess what? Some people are still holding because nobody told them when to sell. Everybody will tell you when to buy a stock. Nobody will tell you when to sell it. So having your own trading plan and the lack of is what makes a bad trader. People who don't have their own trading plan, they have no statistics for their trading. They have no thesis to back up what they're saying. Uh, they just simply think about something and they trade on gut feel. And trust me, gut feel is not to be trusted when it comes to trading. You can pay attention to it, but you still need to have the proper money management and risk management. And uh, that's one of the biggest things I see. It's sad when I read Reddit and see, you know, people blowing up their accounts or still holding GME, still believe, hold the line, you know, so still doing that stuff. And I'm, I feel sad. I'm like, lack of money management. You're never going to make it in this business without that. I think they were selling because there was like a movement of holding, like you said, diamond hands, whoever holds longest yeah. wins. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they win, but um, I think, I think honor points. Um, but perhaps people from um, from the Reddit community can uh, can comment on that. Um, okay, so lack of proper uh, management, lack of a system, lack of control of emotions, and lack of back testing. What do you mean by back testing? How do you back test a, a, a system? So uh, we have different trading patterns that we trade. So we go back and we take a look at. Okay, let's take a look at the last hundred times this exact same pattern set up. What are the odds that this pattern works? What's the win rate? What's the win-loss ratio? And also, what's the sharp ratio, right? What's the average winner like with this pattern? What's the average loser like? So then we input those two things, the win rate and the win-loss ratio, to come up with something known as an expectancy, your trade expectancy. So we need to make sure any pattern we're trading has been back-tested over the last few years, and it has a positive expectancy, right? Once it has a positive expectancy, then we know that all we got to do is just take more of these trades. And on a long enough frequency, the results will be positive. So uh, there's tons of formulas available online. You can look it up, uh, trading expectancy formula. You can input your own statistics from your trades and it'll give you a model if it's positive or negative. If it's negative, then it's negative. You're never going to win long-term using that strategy. So you got to stop doing with a negative expectancy trading model and stick to something that's going to work in a long enough time frame. Having a long enough picture. Like if you want to trade for a living, don't trade like you have to retire next week, right? Trade for the long run. Excellent. Finally, where can we learn about you and um, and follow your work and learn more about your methodologies? Yeah, I think the best way to get in touch with me would be Twitter or Instagram. That's kind of where I'm the most active. Uh, my username on both of those is Delta90, uh, D-E-L-T-A-N-I-N-E-T-Y. Uh, and as far as if you're interested in learning more about trading, you can go to livetradersguide.com. I made a free gu guide and a free video course, completely free. You can download that from there. And that's where you can learn a little bit more about trading the stock market. Excellent. Well, I appreciate your time today. We'll follow uh, Anmo down the links down below. And uh, we'll have you back on next time to talk about uh, markets. Thank you very much. Always good chatting with you. Take care. Take care. And don't forget to subscribe.